Our final uh, presentation in this uh, section on improving human health is going to be from uh, Dr. Mike Gilson on drug discovery innovation. See if I can master the technology. Yep, okay. Um, all right. So I'd, I'd like to begin by saying how interesting and stimulating all the prior talks were, and how many, I mean, like, you're, there's so many connections one can see with the things one is thinking about. It's, it's really quite exciting. And in, also, uh, in the same spirit as a prior talk, I thought I'd start off with a little bit of background about what a drug is and where drugs come from. And I'll, I'll use the example of the cholesterol lowering drug Lipitor, which is. Uh, Shown here, this is a fairly feeble, uh, is there? <laughs> very feeble, I'll point. So um, like most drugs, uh, Lipitor is a small molecule which works by binding a specific protein which has been identified as uh, significant in a disease-related pathway. In this case, it binds the uh, enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, which is a human enzyme that uh, synthesizes cholesterol. And so by inhibiting that enzyme, it essentially reduces uh, our cholesterol levels. Um, historically, uh, a large fraction of drugs have come from nature. This is the example of uh, the garden flower uh, foxglove, which is the origin of uh, digoxin, and, uh, which has been used for a long time to treat uh, congestive heart failure, even before they knew what congestive heart failure was and, and some arrhythmias. Uh, but today, as you know, with uh, basic biomedical research elucidating the molecular level pathways of many diseases, one can take what in some sense, it may be called a more rational approach, or it's perfectly rational to do this as well, um, to identify the proteins that are involved in disease pathways, characterize them as well as possible, for example, by solving the three-dimensional structure, like for HIV protease shown here, and use that information as the basis to discover or design compounds that are, uh, will bind the target and inhibit it or modulate its activity. And as you know, the protease inhibitors, which uh, work against HIV protease uh, are a mainstay of, uh, of AIDS therapy. Of course, uh, drug discovery is, is not really that simple. It's a hard process, and one of the problems that we've seen uh, in recent years is that although there are still many uh, cancers that need to be treated, um, degenerative neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, drug-resistant uh, infectious diseases and new global health challenges, the productivity of the drug companies is in decline. We've seen uh, in red is the productivity of new small molecule drugs since 1996, and you can see that it's dwindled over the years. There's a new class of, of drugs called biologicals, which are drugs that are actually proteins themselves, which are shown in blue, and they are uh, increasingly important, certainly as a fraction of the small molecules, and they're also going up in number. But there's this fundamental problem that the needs for uh, care and needs for therapies are still out there and in some ways are increasing, but the productivity of, uh, of our drug industry is declining. And in the face of this, what we're seeing is that the drug industry is actually disinvesting in uh, basic research uh, towards drug discovery, and they're looking more towards uh, biotech startups and academia to do the basic science work, uh, to, do, to do the innovation that's necessary to come up with new therapies. At the same time, the NIH, um, having invested billions of dollars over many years to uh, elucidate the basic science, the molecular basis of many diseases, is now actually under pressure from Congress, and perhaps justifiably, to turn those insights into therapeutics uh, at a higher rate to, you know, so the American people gets uh, something back, more back for its investment. But this is, this is a challenge. I mean, so drug discovery, you can make it look simple, but it's not. It's, it's very multidisciplinary. One needs biomedical science to elucidate the molecular pathways. One needs uh, chemists, whether computational, synthetic, or natural products, to come up with new compounds that will be bioactive. We need biologists to test the compounds and understand their strengths and their weaknesses in the physiological context. There's a tremendous role for engineering. Uh, both in uh, the technologies for discovering new drugs, whether it's a new assay technology that will give you new insight into the action of a drug on cells or tissues, or a new delivery mechanism uh, for controlled release of insulin, for example. Uh, a related topic is pharmaceutics, which is the formulation of drugs. So many compounds may be active, but they don't go to the right place. They don't make it to the tumor, or they're not properly absorbed. And so there's a science of formulations, which is increasingly becoming a science of polymer and nano and material science, 
uh, to develop smart technologies for delivering drugs to the right place at the right time. There's clearly need for clinical trials, and there's also, I think, a lot of room for innovation in the financing and commercialization, which is required to take a, a, a project from the bench to something that's, I mean, the only way it's really going to get into patients in most cases is if, is, is if it's commercialized and it's an expensive business. So, I mean, the good news is that UCSD is multidisciplinary, and we really have people working in all these areas and innovating in all these areas. So I think we have a tremendous uh, opportunity. Um, in fact, in addition to having people obviously working in biomedical sciences, various aspects of chemistry, biology, engineering, uh, pharmaceutics, uh, medicine, and business, we also, as you know, and we're all here, have a great cu culture of collaboration. Uh, we're also in, I, I think, the third largest uh, cluster of biotechnology and, pharma and uh, pharmaceutical companies, along with our research institutes. And although it's not large, we do have a significant history of, of drug innovation. So there are new drugs that have come out of this uh, university, uh, and there are others in clinical trials now. So with that as background and motivation, I think, uh, w well, what uh, a number of us have done, and I, I mean a number of you are in this room, there are many others who've made it possible to develop a new organized research unit which came into being in December, uh, uh, which now is truly cross-campus in the sense of unifying pharmacy, business, medicine, chemistry, engineering, and SIO as well. I may have left some folks out, but it was unintentional. We really have the possibility to come together and innovate at various stages along the drug discovery process and to work together on new uh, projects. So I see the Center for Drug Discovery Innovation as an intellectual and educational center to foster innovation, a resource for faculty who are working on projects that can generate new drugs and need help with expertise or access to resources, a point of contact for both industry partnerships and uh, really for philanthropists, and uh, the potential to create a nationally visible center of excellence in this field. Among the benefits, I think, are Perhaps the fundamental one for the strategic planning session is really helping UCSD scientists to help people by developing needed therapeutics uh, through innovations and drug discovery that can help many people with these kinds of projects, new business models, the potential for creating, uh, at least to a certain degree, I mean, this is always challenging, a stream of licensing revenue, a way of helping to explain to the outside world the value, the human value of UCSD research, um, and to create uh, training programs in this area. Uh, I just thought I'd show a couple of examples. There are really uh, many one might choose, but these are uh, interdisciplinary. We have Andy McCammon and uh, Victor Nizet from two sides of the campus using computational chemistry to go after uh, methicillin-resistant staph. Uh, and we have a, a, a fantastic uh, group, this is, which is not fully represented in these photos, down at SIO with cross appointments on the general campus, uh, prospecting for uh, bioactive natural products in the marine environment. Um, so to conclude, I mean, I think, you know, one of the issues here is the potential for new FTEs, and I think that there are, uh, there's real potential for cross-campus interdisciplinary FTEs. But I think at the same time, if you ask what we need, it, it's probably as much as anything else funding for research and people, because we have a lot of great people here. A lot of the, the resources that are necessary are present at UCSD, but cost something, or available across town at Sanford Burnham or at another UC. So I think what we really need are matching and seed funds for promising projects so people can carry out the critical experiment and get the grant, or go to be able to make the case to a drug company for uh, further investment. And I think another valuable investment would be collaborative research fellowships for uh, students, postdocs, and uh, non faculty non-faculty scientists to help uh, coalesce teams that are working on some of these challenging interdisciplinary projects. Thank you. That's great. Um, qu a question here? Preclinical testing. And, and that's not something that we've traditionally done here at UCSD, and it's sort of always been contracted out, but right. is that something that you would see developing? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's something that's worth discussing. Let me just tell you where we are with that right now. So this is uh, things like uh, pharma uh, uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, toxicology. Um, I, I think one of the challenges of doing this in the academic arena is 
deciding what's academic and what's not academic, okay? And so there's a certain amount of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and toxicology work where you don't need a faculty member getting R01s to do that work. It's, it, there's a certain aspect that's routine. And what uh, Thomas Hermann and I, who's the co-director, uh, envision is that uh, there may be somebody who wants to put that in place here. We may have the pieces already, and in fact, I think we may have the mass spec of the different pieces to put together. But whether it's that or other things, I think what we'd rather do than to build new infrastructure, maybe selected infrastructure, but we don't want to replicate a drug company, is to do a sort of network science where we say, okay, you need this technology, we have a matching fund, or we have seed funding that will let you do that study at a CRO. There's a tremendous ecosystem of CROs that's grown up these days, or at a neighboring institute. I mean, the alternative really is putting capital into core resources here. And I, you know, from what I, from just interacting with other folks and what I've seen, I think there's a risk of having expensive capital investments, difficult to support things, and you know, it looks like you're gonna be able to do it, but then you end up saddled with these expensive albatrosses, and then the technology changes, okay? So then, could, couldn't we take that money that we were gonna use for that and put it in a, an endowment that would be in a position where somebody could say, okay, I need to do this type of measurement, I'm not gonna to try to go to a, a core which is already outdated and we didn't even put it in for that reason. I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna get $50,000 from that endowment and do the study over at Stanford Burnham or at a CRO. And that's a way, I think, of maintaining, staying sort of fresh and nimble, not falling behind and putting our resources to the best use and essentially trying to keep academia doing what academia does best without trying to replicate industrial resources. So that, that was really a lot of why I talked about that sort of seed funding and matching funds, is to be able to let people access the more workaday kinds of resources. Just a very naive question from a psychologist. I had no idea that marine biology was so important in drug discovery. I, I don't know if you had anything else you could say about that. It's really sure. interesting. Well, I'm going to probably, I'm going to try to channel uh, Bill Gerwig, <laughs> who's one of our leaders, his picture is up there. Basically, so historically, a very large number of drugs are either our natural products or started off and sort of were improved by synthetic chemistry. Uh, but most of them are terrestrial in origin. And basically, the lack of technology to go into the seas and investigate what's there, or the lack of exposure to that has limited what's been found. But there are microorganisms there that make all kinds of crazy compounds. Most natural products basically are toxins. Okay, the plants make them to defend themselves. But they, if they're toxic in a small quantity, it's probably because it does something very specific and it may be useful for killing cells or modulating something. Mike, uh, so clinical trials, as you know, is a very, clinical trials is a very expensive area and a lot of drugs fail at, at that critical stage. So do we have uh, a way of bringing all the things we heard about today, the tools, technology, you know, et cetera, to really make that into a, a you know, more efficient science, you know, because uh, there's so much diversity in, in the human population. Right. If you pick the average white Caucasian male, which, and the most drugs are directed right. against those types of individuals, and you leave out a whole uh, lot of it, just the sample population is just right. totally off. Yeah, I, so I mean, I think um, it's not a field of expertise for me, so I'm not going to claim to know, to have a, a really great vision on that, but <laughs> I'll talk about it anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think there is a sense, you know, I've heard a number of people say that when the drug companies design a clinical trial, you know, it's cut and dried, you have a start point, you have an end point, if it fails, you know, call the strategist, do something else, drop the drug. But there may be potential to say, okay, let's look at what's, what it's doing with the metabolome. Why is it failing in this patient? Is that patient different from another one? And to pull out subgroups where it may be effective versus ineffective. Now, if you do that, you can run into all kinds of statistical problems. But I, I think there is an interest in making clinical trials more, more deeply informative than they typically are now. Mm -hmm. Could I just interject uh, that we have considerable cl clinical trials expertise? Yeah, the CTRI is really the biostatistics and the biostatistics, which okay. affects the CTRI. Excellent. And we have, we have uh, deep experience in designing specific, innovative, efficient clinical trials. Thank you. For the CRO to, uh, if you were to apply that to the genomics core, would be to just give uh, Illumina 
uh, five million bucks and build have an account there, and then we don't have to deal with uh, instrument uh, lifetime. Oh, I know even less about genomics, so I won't I won't venture there. <laughs> But it's, I mean, it is, it is an interesting question. Is it, I mean, I guess it's sort of like, is a company going to buy forklifts or lease forklifts, right? And, you know, there are tax reasons, too. <laughs> so I'd like to come back. To no, 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 okay. I'd like to come back to the clinical trial thing. So you mentioned how pharma is kind of dropping drug discovery, and they're looking to biotech and academia to right. make drug discovery. So are, we, are you suggesting that we move away from a model where UCSD is going to develop a drug, we do some preliminary clinical trials, and then we sell that, we license it to Pfizer? I think I missed the heart of the question. Are we a model where we move away from that? you to change that model? It seems like, you know, we, we write these disclosure statements, and then the company, if they want to license it, then they take it, and they do the $20 million, you know, drug study uh, right. phase three trial. We don't do that. I, Are you suggesting we don't, we move away from that model? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, so... Um, I deliberately included a section on there about business models for drug discovery because I don't think it's clear. I think this whole path thing is changing. And I also have the impression that when you get right down to it, every project is its own story. <laughs> and to some degree, you're going to have to see, you know, is there any, is there, you know, is this project trendy right now? If it's a tr in a trendy area, if everybody's going into cardiovascular now, then you're going to have one picture. But if it's not, you may have to go to NIH and do the trial yourself. So I, I think to some degree it's going to be case dependent. I'm, I'm not ready to advocate for any particular model. It's a good question, though. Might be um, moving into the general discussion here because I, I want to pick up on, on what people have been talking about for the specific case of antibiotics. And antibiotics are a particular challenge. You, you mentioned the work that we've been doing with Victor Nose. We, we're in the frustrating situation of, of having cured methicillin resistant Staph aureus infections in mice, but, but how to get that into humans. And, and uh, Big Pharma is, of course, much more interested in drugs that you have to take your whole life. They're right. not interested so much in investing right. in drugs you only have to take for two weeks. <laughs> um, so maybe Sharon, as well as you, right. is this something that the infectious disease and drug discovery folks might see an angle forward on? I do have one comment. As, as I said, every everything is its story. It depends on what's trendy. And we've been talking with Roche. You know, they fund a small program of grants here that Joan Heller Brown and I help administer. And at our last meeting, they told us they are interested in infectious diseases now, and they are interested in later stage stage project, projects with compounds. So, at the risk of giving an excessively specific answer, it might be worth chatting with Roche about your project at this point. Um, yeah. Great, very, very interesting discussion. Okay.